A deep divine voice broke in the silence of our heart. It says, Leave your native land and your father's house and go to the land that I will show you. This voice was not heard by the ear, but it was clearer and stronger than the roar of any storm. The voice declared, I will make you into a great nation. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you. And through you all the peoples of the earth will be blessed. These words of the Lord started my journey. I am Abraham, born of Abram and Ner of the Chaldees, in the prosperous city of Mesopotamia, where the Tigris and Euphrates rivers nourish the land. My father, Terah, was a respected man, but our lives were simple, marked by the seasons and rituals of a polytheistic society. The divine call was both an awakening and a separation. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and you will be blessed. Genesis 12 How could a man like me, a mere mortal among many, be chosen for such a destiny? The promise was as overwhelming as the night sky beneath which I stood. And here, at the age of 75, my incredible story begins. When I decided to conquer my fear and start the journey, I could not think of reaching the age of 108 or having a big child. Here begins my story, with a heart full of hope and renewed faith. I obeyed the Lord and set out for the land of Canaan with my wife Sarah, Lot, my nephew, and all our possessions, and the people we had gathered together. It was a journey full of hope, guided by divine promises. We traveled northwest through Haran and finally reached Canaan, a land of fertile hills and valleys. It was a diverse region, inhabited by Canaanite peoples and fortified city-states, each ruled by its own king. Canaan's life was different from you are. Here, fields and vineyards stretched as far as the eye could see, and the scent of olive trees and fig trees filled the air. Although the land before us was rich and promising, it was taken over by other cities and cultures. I traveled the country to the holy place of Shechem under the Mori Oak. At that time, the Canaanites owned this land. It was there that the Lord appeared to me again as promised. Then I went to the hill country east of Bethel and pitched my camp between Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. There too I built an altar to the Lord and called upon his name, marking every place of my abode with faith and devotion. Despite the test of our faith, the land of marriage, which had greeted my steps with the blessing of a divine promise, soon fell under the yoke of a severe famine. Why did you bring us to this place? I looked up at the sky in wonder, searching for an answer. The decision to go to Egypt, the land of the Nile and its full granaries, was made with sorrow, knowing that it would test the Almighty's promise to care for my family and not to fear. Fear not, Abraham, echoed the promise. I am your shield, your great reward. Genesis 15. Nevertheless, aware of Sarai's beauty and fearing for my life, I made a plan. Sheep, cows, donkeys, maidservants and camels marked my stay in Egypt, which was full of contrast between the opulence of the palace and the servitude of many of its inhabitants. Yet, because of the inn, the Lord dealt a great blow to Pharaoh and his people. Pharaoh, realizing the truth, confronted me. What have you done to me? Why did you not tell me that she is your wife? Why did you say that she is your sister, allowing me to take her as my wife? Here is your wife, with her. Go. He ordered his men to take us away with Sarai and all our possessions. As we were driven out of Egypt, we returned to Canaan not only with more than we could carry, but also with a deeper understanding of the nature of our God, a protector, a provider, and an unfailing guide in times of uncertainty. From Egypt, I went to the Negev with my wife and all our possessions, and Lot came with us. By God's blessing, I accumulated a lot of wealth in cattle, silver, and gold. We continued our journey northward, returning to Bethel, our first encampment between Bethel and Ai, where I had previously built an altar to the Lord, and where I again called upon his name. Lot, who was with me, also had sheep, cattle, and tents. Our property grew so much that there was not enough room for us and our herds, which led to conflict between my herdsmen and Lot. At the time, the region was inhabited by Canaanites and Perizzites, which further complicated the situation. To avoid conflict and maintain peace, I propose a solution to Lot. There should be no conflict between us, not even between our herdsmen because we are family. See the whole country before you. If you want to go left, I'll go right. If you prefer to go right, I'll go left. Lot looked over the Jordan Valley, which was a fertile land, reminiscent of the Garden of the Lord, or Egypt before the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. He chose the entire region of the Lower Jordan for himself and moved eastward, physically separating us. I was in Canaan when Lot settled near Sodom, where the people were notorious for their wickedness 
and sin against the Lord. After Lot and I parted, the Lord spoke to me once more, repeating his promise. From where you are, look north, south, east, and west. All the land you see, I will give you. And to your descendants, I will I will make you as numerous as the dust of the earth. If one can count the dust, your descendants can be numbered. I traveled across the country, fully aware of the divine promise given to me. Finally, I removed my camp and settled near the Mamre Oak in Hebron, where I built an altar and communed with the Lord, deeply grateful for his guidance and promise of blessings for me and my descendants. One day, the Lord appeared to me as I sat at the entrance of my tent in the Oaks of Mamre in the hottest part of the day. I looked up and saw three men standing beside me. Without hesitation, I ran towards them from the entrance of my tent and bowed to the ground in a gesture of respect and hospitality. I said, O oh my Lord, if I have found favor in your sight, please do not let your servant pass by. Stop for a while and rest under this tree. Let me bring some water so that you may wash your feet and rest under this tree. I will also bring you a piece of bread that you may refresh yourself before you go, for you have come to your servant. For some reason they agreed and said, Do as you say. Immediately, I went to Sarah's tent and begged her, Hurry up, take three measures of the best flour and grind it, and bake some bread. Then, I ran to the herd, selected a choice, well-fed calf, and handed it to a servant to prepare without delay. I served curd, milk, and the calf that had been prepared for our guests, who sat under the tree as they ate. When they asked about my wife Sarah, I replied that she was in the tent. One of them, whose words carried the weight of divine promise, said, I will surely return to you this time next year, and by then Sarah will have a son. Sarah, who was listening from the entrance to the tent, laughed to herself, doubting the possibility of experiencing motherhood at our advanced age. The viewer learned of Sarah's smile and asked, Why did Sarah smile, thinking, Am I old now? Is it too difficult for the Lord I will return to you next year at the appointed time, and Sarah will give birth to a son. Terrified, Sarah refused to smile, but the Lord confirmed, Yes, you smile. After the men left for Sodom, I pondered the divine purpose and prepared to bid them farewell. As the Lord shared his plan with me, considering whether to hide what he would do in Sodom and Gomorrah, I knew that I would be the founder of a great and blessed nation, chosen to teach justice and righteousness to my descendants. Before the imminent destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, I went to the Lord, interceding for the city. Will you really destroy the righteous with the wicked? If there are fifty righteous in the city, will you destroy it? The Lord promised that he would save the city for fifty righteous people. Driven by our concern for justice, I continued to intercede, reducing the number of righteous men needed to prevent the destruction of the city to just ten. The Lord, in his mercy, agreed not to destroy the city if he found these ten righteous men. When the two angels came to Sodom that evening, my nephew Lot was sitting at the city gate. Seeing them, he rose to meet them, showed respect, and bowed to the ground. He asked them to spend the night in his house, his servants' quarters, where they could wash their feet and go on their way in the morning. Although the angels resisted at first, expressing their desire to spend the night in the square, Lot's persistent invitation convinced them, and they finally accepted his hospitality and went to his house. Lot prepared a meal for them, baked unleavened bread, and they ate. We had not spent much time together when the men of Sodom, from young to old, surrounded the house, demanding that Lot be handed over to the men so that they could abuse them. Lot went out to confront them and, closing the door behind him, begged them not to do such an abomination. He even offered his two virgin daughters rather than harm his guests, a desperate decision that showed his commitment to protecting those who came to his home. However, the crowd rejects him and threatens to treat him worse than the others. When they tried to force their way in, Angels intervened, saving Lot and blinding the attackers so they couldn't find the door. Later, the angels revealed to Lot the purpose of their visit, the impending destruction of Sodom because of its great wickedness. They urged Lot to gather his family and leave the city. Lot tried to warn his sons-in-law, but they did not take him seriously. At dawn, before Lot could hesitate, the angels took him by the hand with his wife and daughters and led them out of the city by the grace of the Lord. Once safe, the angels warned Lot to flee into the mountains without looking back. Lot, fearing that he would not be able to go that far, sought refuge in a small town nearby, Zor. The angel agreed, allowing Lot and his family to take refuge there. When the sun rose and Lot reached Zor, the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah with brimstone and fire from heaven. Lot's wife, disobeying the command not to look back, became a pillar of salt. The next morning, 
I returned to the place where I stood before the Lord, watching in horror as the smoke of destruction rose from the ground. Although divine judgment fell on Sodom and Gomorrah, the Lord remembered his promise to me and spared Lot, proof of divine justice and mercy in judgment. The destruction of this city was a poignant reminder of the consequences of sin and the importance of obedience to God. From there, I moved to the Negev region, settling there. Then Abimelech, king of Gerar, took Sarah to his palace. That night, God intervened in an interesting way. He appeared to Abimelech in a dream and warned him that he was about to make a grave mistake with Sarah, for she is my wife. Abimelech, surprised and frightened by the dream, defended his innocence before God, claiming that he had acted in good faith based on the information that both Sarah and I had given him. God, in his mercy, recognized his innocence and, precisely for this reason, intervened to prevent him from sinning against him. God commanded that Sarah be returned to me and added that I would intercede for her as a prophet so that Abimelech would not die. At dawn, Abimelech called his servants and told them what had happened, causing fear among them. Then he called me and asked with great pain why I had done such a thing, exposing him to such a grave sin. In my defense, I explained that I believed that Gerard did not fear God and that I feared for my life because of my wife. I also revealed that I did not lie about Sarah as my sister, as she is really my half-sister as well as my wife. I explained that Sarah and I agreed to say this to protect ourselves. Abimelech, in a gesture of goodwill to repair the misunderstanding, returned Sarah to me and compensated us with sheep, cattle, male, and female slaves. He also gave his land for us to settle where we thought fit. Moreover, Abimelech gave Sarah a thousand pieces of silver to erase her honor. After this deep incident, the God intervened for Abimelech, his family, and his servants so that they could have children again, because God had closed the wombs of all the women in Abimelech's family because of Sarah. God heard my prayers and healed all of Abimelech's family, again showing his mercy. And the Lord visited Sarah and me in a miraculous way, fulfilling his promise in a way that exceeded all our expectations. Sarah conceived in my old age and gave birth to a son, as God had declared. When our son was born, I obeyed God and named him Isaac. Eight days after his birth, I circumcised Isaac, faithfully following divine instructions. At that time, I was a hundred years old, a testament to God's power and faithfulness. Sarah, overcome with joy, exclaimed, God has brought me laughter, and all who hear about this will laugh with me. We never imagined that in our old age we would be blessed with the joy of a son. The day Isaac was weaned, I celebrated with a great feast, marking the beginning of a new chapter in our lives. However, not everything in our family was cause for celebration. One day, Sarah saw Ishmael, Hagar's son born to me, mocking Isaac. It was Sarah who told me to banish Hagar and her son, because she did not want Ishmael to share the inheritance with Isaac. This request pained me deeply, because Ishmael was also my son. But God intervened, telling me not to be upset because of my son or your maid. He told me to do as Sarah had said, because through Isaac my descendants would be numbered. However, God promised to make Ishmael a nation, because he was my descendant. With a heavy heart, but trusting in God's promise, I prepared Hagar and Ishmael for their journey, provided for them, and bid farewell at dawn. God did not abandon Ishmael. When Hagar and the boy found themselves in a dire situation in the desert, God intervened, assuring them of a future and divine protection. Ishmael grew up in the desert, became a skilled archer, and his mother arranged for him to marry an Egyptian woman. During this time, Abimelech and Phicol, the commander of his army, acknowledged God's favor upon me and tried to establish a relationship of mutual obedience. I promised to treat them with the loyalty they had shown me. However, a dispute arose over the well that Abimelech's servants had occupied. Despite this conflict, we were able to reach an agreement and solidify our agreement by exchanging gifts and oaths at Beersheba, which means well of oaths. After this remarkable event, one day God decided to test me. He called and said, Ibrahim, here I am. I replied, always ready to hear his voice. Then, he gave me a command that would stir the heart of any father. Take your only son, Isaac, whom you love so much. Go to the region of Moriah and offer him as a burnt offering on a mountain that I will show you. The storm of emotions that flooded me at that moment is beyond description. Nevertheless, with unwavering faith in God, I got up the next morning, got my donkey ready, and set off with my two servants and my beloved son Isaac. I cut wood for the sacrifice, and we proceeded to the place God had directed. On the third day of our journey, we saw the destination in the distance. 
I order my servants to stay with the donkey while Isaac and I continued. We will worship, then we will return to you, I assured them. I loaded Isaac with wood for the sacrifice and placed him on the altar. As I went forward to take the knife to carry out God's command, a voice from heaven stopped me. Ibrahim, Abraham, it was the angel of the Lord. I replied, here I am. And the angel instructed me not to harm the boy, revealing that my fear of God was genuine because I had not withheld my only son. I looked around and saw a ram holding its horns in the bush. I took it as a burnt offering in place of my son. That place was called, The Lord Will Provide, a declaration that became a testimony of God's provision and faithfulness. The angel of the Lord blessed me again from heaven, and we returned to Beersheba, where I lived, reflecting on the deep lessons of faith and obedience that God had taught me on Mount Moriah. Sarah, my beloved wife, lived to the age of 127. Kiryat Arba in the land of Canaan, today known as Hebron, his death has left me deeply saddened. I mourned her, feeling the deep void in my life with her gone. After some time, I went to the sons of hate, for I was a stranger among them and owned no land. I said, although I am a foreign resident among you, please give me a plot of land to bury my wife. I wanted to buy it at a fair price to set up a family tomb among them. Ephron, who was present at the meeting, generously offered both the field and the cave in front of everyone, saying, I give it to you in the presence of my fellow citizens. Bury your wife. Therefore, Ephron's field at Machpelah, with the cave and all its contents, became my property, formally acquired before the leaders of the community. There, I buried Sarah, making the field of Machpelah, facing the Mamre of Canaan, our family tomb. This acquisition before the sons of hate ensured a resting place for my family for generations, a testament to my life in them, and my commitment to the land promised by God. After Sarah's death, I found comfort and companionship in Keturah, the woman I married. He blessed me with more children, Zimran, Jokshan, Madon, Midian, Ishbak, and Shua, expanding the family God had promised me. Jokshan, one of my sons, the father of Sheba and Dedan, continuing the line that the Lord had promised, which would be as numerous as the stars of the sky. To Isaac, the son of my promise to Sarah, I bequeathed all my possessions, fulfilling what God had established. I lived to be 175 years old, a life full of challenges and blessings, marked by my relationship with God and my devotion to His commandments. When my time came, I departed peacefully, satisfied with the life I had led, and reunited with my ancestors, leaving a legacy of faith and loyalty. My sons, Isaac and Ishmael, despite their distance and differences, came together to bury me in the cave of Machpelah, the place I had acquired as a family tomb. I hope this story inspires future generations to trust God and follow His ways, just as Abraham did. If you want to know more about the events of the Bible, do not miss the next video that is now showing on the screen. Discover what the world was like before the Great Flood. Click and see. Thank you for being hearing, and God bless you always.